Welcome, everyone. I want to start my talk today by taking something off your chest. You see this chair? It's for you. I want each of us to put something on this chair. I'll start. That said, the name that I gave my eating disorder, the most self-limiting, lethal voice to ever live in my mind, I want you to do the same. Visualize your inner voice. Maybe it's an eating disorder, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a self-limiting belief. Whatever that voice is for you, I want you to give it a name and send it over. Don't worry, it'll still be here when we're done. This simple act is not only why I am here today, but the foundation of my recovery. So often we feel our biggest struggles, our biggest fears, are a synonym for who we are. I was the anorexic. Maybe you were the perfectionist and you were the addict. When we give these voices the power to veil over our identity, they will spread like ivy, intrusively wrapping around every part of our life. How can you ever expect to heal these voices if you give them the power to take over you? You can't. But here's the good news. You are not defined by your ed. Although these voices are loud, they are not you. Now that you know who you are and who your ed is, you can choose who to listen to. But of course, it's not so simple. Healing is not linear and it does not come with a step-to-step -step manual. In fact, it's more like a roller coaster with high highs and low lows, but strap on tight, honey, because going on this roller coaster is the best decision you can make. Let me tell you about my healing roller coaster. Ed first came knocking at my door at the age of 15. I was in a place in my life where I felt completely out of control. And so I thought, why not take control of the one thing that I can, my body? It started with health kicks, trying to work out and pay attention to what I was eating until one day I skipped a workout. A little voice crept in, carrying with it so much shame so much guilt. This little voice kept growing louder and louder until the mental punishments would no longer suffice. I started to purge. First once a week, twice, three times every day. Eventually my throat was in so much pain I could barely speak. For those of you who know me, you know how much I love to talk. So this was a big problem. I couldn't continue, but I also couldn't stop. This illusion of control felt so good. What do I do now? This little voice quickly came up with solutions, rules, and I listened. No eating before 11 or after eight. Go to the gym every day, don't eat out with people, don't eat unless you have to. Ed's rules became increasingly more difficult and every time I followed, I'd be left drowning in an ocean of shame and guilt, suffocating. You're probably wondering, why was I listening to Ed if it brought me so much hurt? You see, Ed brought me control, safety. And this little voice turned into a problem-solving vessel for everything. When I was sad, when I hated my body, when the people in my life hurt me, Ed was always there to numb the pain. It worked. I became numb. But I didn't just become numb to pain. I became numb to joy, to love, to happiness all fading into distant memories. This all sounds so sad to me now, but in the moment, I was convinced that I was thriving. I had it all sorted out. Eating disorders bombard you with their ideals until you believe these ideals to be yours. I truly believe my worth lied in the gap between my thighs and starving myself. When I was able to achieve these things, I felt like the epitome of control, joy, happiness. When you think you feel such bliss, why would you even consider letting go? Eventually, my body started feeling the consequences. My periods were the first to go, followed by my energy, my warmth, my hair, my heartbeat beating at just 42 beats per minute. But I was numb. Ed would justify all these symptoms and tell me to keep going. I was living behind bars, thinking it was a castle, succumbing to Ed's every rule. 
Ed decided to make one last rule. Don't eat, period. I tried with all of me to commit to this rule, but I couldn't. One day I ate, and a switch flipped in me, going into survival mode, and so I ate, and ate, and ate, until I physically could not fit another bite. I then leaned over the toilet, crying from Ed's screams. When I was done, I opened my eyes to see red. That was the first time Ed made me feel unsafe. I was so scared, I knew I had to tell someone. The next day, I worked up the courage and told my mom. Man, was it scary. My mom, having suffered from an eating disorder herself, decided to take me to the doctor. The doctor then took some vitals and told us they'd get back to us with just a few days. That same day, we went to go see an outpatient treatment. This is five days a week, seven hours per day, and it seemed that would be the plan. I'd start in just a few days. That same day, we received a call from this clinic. We received your daughter's vitals. We cannot take her. She is too sick and needs a higher level of care. What? I felt I was dreaming. I was fine. Eating disorders are not a choice. They mask over everything. I was dying and didn't even know I was sick. I was admitted into a residential facility where I stayed very shortly. Their methods did not work for me. After I left, this clinic was when my true healing began. I met my angel, my therapist, Amanda. She helped me identify Ed and put him on a chair. She looked at me and said, all these voices, these self-sabotaging thoughts, they are not you, they're your Ed. I felt liberated. For the first time, I felt someone was looking at me like Francesca, not anorexia. She then asked me a question. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? I went on to tell her about my dream life, full of success, friends, travel, and an amazing career. She looked at me and said, that life is amazing. That life is waiting for you. But do you think you can achieve that life with Ed by your side? No, I can't. I broke down. Through this incredibly difficult therapy session, I began to find my desire to recover and my whys. I want to see the world. I want energy. I want to be healthy. I want freedom. I want to be a good friend. I want to enjoy food. And so we began my healing journey and my divorce to Ed. I made sure to give him back everything that was his. His clothes, his want for my smallness, his treasured shame, all of it. So now, what can you do about your Ed? I want you to look at your Ed. Ask him, why is he there? To try and help you find control? To keep you safe, to protect you from a traumatic past? Have a conversation with your Ed. Hear him, but let him know his methods are no longer serving you. Give him back what's his and put all that energy Ed has into something which will benefit. Which seeds do you want to plant and nourish in your mind? I started to heal, but was at a point now where I despised my body and my mind. I struggled to find anything that I liked about myself. My body image became my biggest trigger. My appearance wasn't what started my eating disorder, but became the biggest justification Ed would use to make sure I stayed. Ed had not only distorted my mind, but my vision too. The truth is, it didn't matter what I weighed. Ed was never pleased. My body became so unsafe. It makes sense my shape is what Ed clinged on to because it is consistently supported by the outside world. We are consistently told how we should look, what we should eat, preach not to take up too much space. Bodies have started to trend. This is ridiculous. Music, clothes, slang should be trends, but bodies? No. The diet industry is a $360 billion industry, growing off our insecurities, daily grooming us to not only unachievable ideals, but to believe that our body is the most interesting thing about us. But your body, it's the least important thing about you. Beauty lies in the way you light up about your passions, the way your body uniquely moves, the sunshine you radiate with each smile. Beauty cannot be quantified by a number. But of course, 
This was a very hard thing for my Ed to understand. And so I took a different route. I was introduced to a concept called body neutrality. This notion shifted the way I saw my body. Body neutrality is a concept of loving your body for what it does for you rather than how it looks. So loving your arms because they allow you to hug ones you love, your eyes for helping you see, your stomach for carrying all your organs safely. Body neutrality kept me on the road to recovery and set a foundation to love my body forever. This idea helped me respect and accept my body. And understanding how much influence a diet culture has made me realize that my body image was stored in my brain cells, not my fat cells. Body neutrality is a beautiful foundation. However, I believe celebrating your body's external too is also so valuable. But I didn't know how to do this. This is where I introduced a concept I like to call full body love. Full body love is built upon a foundation of body neutrality and pushes you to celebrate your body's external too. Full body love does not mean waking up every day and loving every inch of what you see. It's the day you wake up and realize you've stopped apologizing for your body, the space you take. It's knowing your worth even on days you feel horrible. Accepting and respecting your body's uniqueness. Practicing this is different every day. Some days I wake up and feel safer in a more body neutral stance, but other days I look in the mirror and go, damn, I look good. At first, of course, I didn't fully believe the words coming out of my mouth. But the more I practice this every day, the more these words turned into reality. Since practicing full body love, my confidence has risen so much and my biggest ed trigger, obliviated. We have to start bringing more awareness to the devastation the diet culture brings and mental illness, which it inevitably boosts. 53% of American girls are unhappy with their bodies. This grows to 78% by the time these girls reach 17. One in every four dieters will gain an eating disorder. This is unacceptable. Currently, eating disorders are the most lethal mental illness, killing one in every 10 people diagnosed. If you are struggling, please remember, you are not your disorder. Now that you know who is you and who is your Ed, you can choose who to listen to. But remember, healing is not one big choice. It's a choice you must make every single day. The more you choose yourself, the more you choose recovery, the closer healing becomes. If you know someone struggling with an eating disorder, please be okay with not fully understanding. Eating disorders are not logical. The best thing you can do for someone struggling is make them feel heard. Support them and encourage them to find a team which will help them do so. And remember, eating disorders do not discriminate against numbers. Only 6% of people struggling with an eating disorder are clinically underweight. Eating disorders come in all shapes and sizes, but no one is less devastating. I want to leave you with one last thought, a little recap. Neurons that fire together, wire together. When you actively engage in something, it becomes easier to do because your neural circuits become stronger, rewiring not just your mind, but your brain. Think about if you've ever played an instrument. The more you practice, the easier and more natural it gets. Healing is the same. The more you practice, the easier and more natural it gets. But just like playing, you can't just pick up and play. You have to learn to read notes. Learn how to rest your hands on the instrument, count beats. All together, all these things combined will lead you to playing. Healing is like playing an instrument. You have to tie all the pieces together, distinguishing yourself from your Ed, finding your whys, finding full body love, and practicing every single day. It may sound messy at first. You will squeak and you will miss beats, but be gentle on yourself. Missing one beat does not mean you are back to square one. It's just that, one beat. By the end, you will be playing the most beautiful symphony that has been heard. I can't wait to hear your symphony. Thank you.